last couple of years, we do not have uh, minutes. Uh, Justin's been kind to uh, record our, our meetings and they're on the uh, Eastgate's website under the GAP GAP. Um, I'd like to introduce Grant Taylor, who's the GIS specialist for Eastgate. Grant, the floor is yours. Hi, hello everyone. Um, I am here to speak about um, Safe Streets for All and our progress on working on creating a comprehensive uh, safety plan for the region. Right. So, one of our goals for this whole thing is working towards the Safe Streets for All has been a discretionary grant program um, created through the bipartisan infrastructure law, a bunch of money, five billion going out over five years for all of it. Um, it's focusing on preventing roadway deaths and serious injuries. It's been the real big goal for this is to focus on trying to get rid of any fatal accidents that are happening on the roads. Uh, work through the USDOT through their uh, what they've been working on with the roadway safety strategies and going towards the zero roadway deaths using safe system approach, which has been a new initiative that Federal Highway has been pushing. So I have a, this is our consultant made the slides and I, I, I want everything up there at all times, so not the click through. So, um, so the safe system approach really comes down to is looking at a few different little aspects of what's important. Your safe road users, making sure that the road users are being safe, safe vehicles, which comes down to the technology that gets put into them, um, safe speeds, a safe roadway, and post-crash care. And the idea is that it's not just going to be about engineering. That's not the only thing you need to look at. You need to look at are people being educated properly on how to use the roads, are the roads being put to safe speeds. And the important thing that comes out of a lot of this is the idea that there is no one solution. You need multiple solutions for a lot of this stuff because of the fact that solutions don't work every time. So we want to have multiples going on. Um, so again, it comes down to you know, anticipating human error or if you can't deal with the error, making it so it's a lesser accident. So the idea that you can't fix everything so even then you want to push it towards reducing how bad it can be. Um, one of the things you described as a Swiss cheese model, which is, you know, each layer of Swiss cheese is one of these different strategies that you're putting into place that even if something falls through one of the holes, the goal being it's caught somewhere else. So safety action plan is our guide towards eliminating fatal and serious injuries. Um, it comes together, the project, the plan is being put together right now by the consultants. It is going to have a recommendations for projects, policies, programs, uh, a general guidebook for a large amount of people, not just us. It'll be something that other people can look at and utilize. So within this is a commitment from leadership to be working towards a vision zero, having a planning structure to it, a safety analysis, which has been being done by the consultants with looking at a bunch of data, which is a lot of what I'm gonna be going into today. Uh, engagement and collaboration, equity is a huge part of this. It's, they really are pushing this through a lot of different methods and there's a lot going on there that within the safety realm, the equity is a, actually a really big component of. Um, some policy changes, a strategy and project selection, which is coming up with some different project recommendations and ways that they can be fixed. And then we have to start to also do some progress and transparency over going forward of reporting out some of this data and stuff like that, what we're looking at and how stuff is being moved forward. Um, we've been working with environmental design group and they've also got two sub consultants, WSP and tool design working underneath of them. So process was started out with was data collection, uh, which is a lot of the stuff that we've we've been doing in the past and they took it a little bit further with some more people that got a lot more specialized into it where they're taking 
all of this different crash data and putting it together and doing a big analysis on it to generate high injury networks. We're trying to find areas where these serious and fail accidents are occurring the most. Here's so what this is a map showing out. This, you know, the places in the darker red is spots where the it's much more likely to have serious and fail accidents. Um, also been looking, yeah. In those maps, where is Youngstown? Um, Youngstown is, does it show the mouse on there? No. Uh, yeah. yeah, it's right here under all of that. Right. <laughs> Pick up the crashes. There are is a lot more traffic in those areas. There's a lot more roads in those areas, which is a, a big part of it, but yes. So one of the next things that was done was we actually did do a uh, public survey that went out to online. We had some communities push it out. We did some door to door of actually handing these flyers out to people in some areas, to try to get some more responses. And we got somewhere around like 100 and 150 responses um, for people wanting to express their opinions on safety in the area. You consider that a good turnout of opinions, 150 or so? How many did you try and? How many things did you send out or touch people with to end up getting the 150? So we did through most of our stuff was going through social media just because of our short time frame. We had a. We had it put out and then we worked with a lot of communities, getting them to put out through their social media. I don't know how many doors were gone to where they went door to door, at least in some areas, reaching out to people that way and then also trying to get some um, community groups also to get some of these flyers out and stuff. So then do you think it's a representative sample? If it's not if it's not necessarily representative of the whole population, if it's focused on social media, I would think it would skew younger, which might not be a bad thing. I it is that is one thing that is an issue though with with would have been nice to have had a longer time frame that we would have been able to get out, but our hope was at least through a lot of the the community groups having some of their stuff going out that way. When was this done? What was the timeline to gather that information? For the for the the interaction with getting suggestions and everything, it was it like six months or a year? How how did that work? Uh it was uh it was three months. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, February through uh, just recently, and I just never heard of it. Hmm. All right. And it just went right back up. Just my fault on that one. Sorry about that. As soon as it connected, I exited out and says minimize again. So no problem. Uh, 
All right, sorry about that. Um, and within, if we had more time frame, we would like to have been able to do more with it. Um, so that we've had a deadline coming up here this month to get uh, applications in for our first round of funding, which we've been pushing for. Um, that said, we're still they're still receiving information now for this stuff. There's still been work with communities. Um, Um, this is a map showing out the zip codes, at least of where that they did get responses from. Uh, one of the questions that was asked through it was about how often people use certain types of transportation. Um, showing you know, the black color there, uh, showing that up on the left, about 80% of people said they're always driving a personal vehicle. You can see the in the middle where it's got the green. Some of the time, getting about forty-five percent said they were walking places. Which, with walking, is everybody walks anyways? Because even if you drive, you still walk to get to where you're going to. But at least these are people saying that walking is an a large part of what they're doing. Um, showing scooter and Uber, Lyft, taxi. Showing over on the right is almost never. Um, a wide variety in the middle for where people are traveling through these different methods. Um, so and then another question that was asked, though, was the level of concern for different roadway issues. Um, ranging between extremely concerned, very concerned, somewhat not very or not all concerned. Um, at least, you know, distracted driving, speeding, aggressive driving and bicycle and pedestrian safety are extremely concerned are been the big responses that came back. Um, so there's something that's going to be important that we'll be making sure they're being looked at a lot. There's like 224, like Pole and then Boardman. Pole is like 25. And as soon as you cross into Boardman on 224, it's 40. You know, people are coming in from Boardman into Bo Poland. They're going 40 or 50 and that, you know, they, I wonder how many accidents are there. And then in Louisville, going into Struthers, and Struthers going to Louisville, going out of Louisville is 50 miles per hour. Going into Struthers on 289 Wilson Avenue is 35. <laughs> Sometimes the cop sits there, you know, and waiting. Right. And then you're going into, and from Struthers into Louisville, 35, then you hit another 50, you know, 50, you know, people hit the gas pedal, you know. That's, that's what they call it. Uh, Speed trap or mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. yeah. So I'm just wondering if you looked into that situation. Yeah, I'm making notes of those specific ones off the top of my head. I did Lobo Australia was the one I wasn't familiar with. Port and the two my Port Poland. I lived right quite near. Rates. Yeah, I lived around that area quite a bit. So yeah, and that's a huge issue right there. Is with, it's actually a lot of communities that's come up with. We talk, some of the communities we talked to is that was stuff they would go into is, you know, as it was, you know, our community is 25, but right outside the border there is 45 and it takes a mile before they finally slow down, stuff like that. So is it legal? So the speed limits are typically set by the state. Uh, there are different speed limit requirements that go into effect, um, which typically comes down to something like a cities or villages within their bounds on most roads end up being 25, whereas a township may be 45. Uh, for communities to change it, they have to go through a, a uh, speed zone process where they have to do tests, look at what the travel rate is. So yes, it's legal. It's how it's supposed to be set up, but there's some people out there who would like to have some look at how that's done and some of the communities, it's been an important issue to them. The uh, dark maroon, <clears throat> which is 44512, what does that consist of? Is that the Youngstown? It's Boardman. That's Boardman. Part of Youngstown, too, is 12. I believe so, but I'm not 100% sure off the top of my head. So the, because it's dark, well, what does that represent? Does that represent anything? It doesn't. 
a larger uh, it's where we had a larger amount of the responses came from one of the questions we asked was just zip code we didn't want to get into people specific information but we still wanted to have some information about where they they were from so it wasn't done in other areas of youngstown but the zip code uh, there's some responses that came back throughout different areas of Youngstown South, just not the highest, which was important. <clears throat> this is a random sample scientific right. survey. No, it was just a public outreach survey. How many respondents? I don't know off the top of my head right now, um, but last I checked, it was somewhere between one hundred and one hundred and fifty. Um, another question was what factors uh, most contribute to making the roadways unsafe? Uh, things came up, which were roadway surface conditions, uh, driver behavior choices, uh, no pedestrian sidewalks or gaps in sidewalks, and uh, the no bike lanes and poor lighting. Uh, pretty much from people we talked with, as well as the surveys, that was a lot of stuff that came up. Uh, the roadway surface conditions was worded as roadway surface conditions because we didn't want to just include potholes, which people like to blame. So it was sort of trying to get a little bit away from the word pothole, but there still is an impact there. So um, another question was, have you ever been in a crash or almost crash, which 78% of people who respond, responded said that they had been in a crash or near crash, um, and then what factors were contributing to it? And stuff came back a lot was driver failed to yield appropriately, such as left and not giving traffic, running red lights, um, which the driver running a red light has hit me while we were working on this. So um, following too closely and snow and ice and water, which has actually been one of the more shocking ones because a lot of people in this area assume that that's when a lot of our accidents are occurring is when it's in the snow, but it was maybe a little bit lower than we had expected to come back as. But we kind of just are thinking that might just be because people around here know how to drive on the snow a lot better than. Or well, we've had recently mild winters. That is very true. Um, so other questions which were the conditions that would improve for people to feel more comfortable um, traveling by walking, wheelchair, using a bike or scooter, and using public transportation. Um, throughout a lot of the stuff about the walking was more sidewalks, better sidewalks were the big things there. Um, for the bikes, KMAC was, you know, protected bike lanes, but also people want a lot more education for drivers about bicycles. And then um, for public transportation was uh, there was a large response saying that they weren't going to use it, but also uh, more routes to places and the better bus stop facilities. So the process here is one of the next things we also were doing was um, the stakeholder feedback. Um, which I just hit one too many times on. Uh, we also one thing we did do was we were working with different communities. Um, where we set up to get all the communities, we got a large amount of them where we were meeting with individual communities within our region. So we were meeting with the, we met with mayors, we met with township administrators, engineers, we met with planners, we um, met with police, we met with some fire people, and we met with some uh, nonprofit community groups trying to find out what was issues to them. So we were, trying to get this wide spectrum of people who were experiencing this and dealing with this stuff on a regular basis there as well. Um, and then getting their input on stuff. And a lot of what we were trying to do with that was, there's a lot, we have a lot of data about the stuff, but that doesn't tell us that there's this place that everybody complains about because there's so many near misses. That's not gonna show up in the data if they never actually have an accident. And there was some other stuff where that, you know, 
they were able to come back and say, well, there's a large amount of crashes are occurring at this road down here in Canfield Township in August and September. I'm going, yeah, that's when the Canfield Fair is, and that's why it shows so much more in that area. And help us sort of get some of these context clues that might define what was going on in some of these areas. Um, so one of the next big things here is we also are trying to tie in poverty into this. The analysis of this is going along. Um, using areas that are high poverty. And looking at a few different things, because a lot of this comes down to is in these areas where you have poverty is an accident can be a lot worse. If you have an accident, you may not be able to get to work and lose a job or if you don't have any alternatives or the impact of having a car repaired can be greater than you can, and it has a bigger impact as well as you do end up with a lot more people that have to walk, and that puts them at a lot more risk in these areas. So that's one of the big things being pushed is trying to make sure that this is also looked at as an additional component of the safety analysis. So through the data, we end up coming up with some of our priority areas of roadways that are these segments that are are the most problematic that we've seen through the data and taking stakeholder input and having that being a response to an additional factor and poverty. Um, here's a listing that goes through it, which is not a finalized list. They've still been putting in some more additional input in some of the stuff. But it comes down with each of these different roadways, figuring out what the poverty rate is. If it's urban, if it's rural, there's additional lists for each category there. Um, it's looking at the FSI score, which is the fatal serious injuries. Um, we've been looking at it very much as fatal and serious are for the most part on the same level, just because of the idea that a serious injury on a young person might be a fatal injury on an even younger person and that they're it's a little bit more of a uh, word just completely escaped me but the idea it still is a big impact at that yes i can understand a fatal injury but how do you determine what a serious injury is a serious injury is typically it's hospitalized usually through like something like an ambulance services uh, there's some defined through the FHWA for what a, what is considered a serious injury. So when the crashes get reported, they come back as either a property damage, a injury possible, minor injury, serious injury, or fatal. So and then we also looked at segments specifically focused on bike and pedestrian, where we're looking at that type of data, trying to bring a lot more of that in, which found a lot of that does line up with where it's still more dangerous, even for the automobiles, it's still the same segments that are high risk. Um, but a lot of the time, you know, the treatments that can help with bike and pedestrians do actually help end up helping with um, car accidents in those areas as well. So we had, yeah, I did rural, and then we also have urban ones for the bike and pedestrian segments. And then we also have them focused on specific intersections going through it. For the urban with all traffic. Again, so basically using the same thing. It's methodology used through everything. Uh, we got the rural intersections. And then urban bike and pedestrian intersections as well. Once more rural intersections. If anybody has any information on more of the locations, I'm glad to give get that information or talk about anything specific. So the next step that sort of comes out of this at this point in time is the idea that we've got now more of this somewhat finalized list of these locations, but we're gonna be looking at which locations are near the top of this list and starting to get together some suggestions for how these uh, should be looked at or what kind of treatment can help out with these areas or 
even which locations may just need to be studied an additional amount because there's not an easy fix that comes out of everything. Um, so the plan itself is planned to be done here um, this month where uh, they're getting so most of it's being finalized right now. They're putting together that stuff. Um, there's going to be some stuff in there also for communities to help with funding assistance and strategies. So we'll have some information about these are different funding programs that can help with safety. These are places to go through. Um, the big thing coming out of it is the Safe Streets for All application for funding, which is communities will be able to use the plan for applying for. Um, there's also well, that's higher safety improvement program. The ODNR has some stuff. A lot of this information will be detailed throughout to help these communities. So, and then we'll be identifying this, you know, the high risk networks, systemic safety, uh, which is systemic safety is not worrying necessarily about where crashes are occurring. It's taking a look at the roadways themselves, such as the lanes, the speed, and looking for which ones have the highest accidents and trying to use that more of to predict what conditions are out there to that could cause more accidents. Um, there's going to be some more information in there about you know the transit and equity and an access. Um, there's going to be some recommendations for the communities we all met with that are going to have some stuff for them specifically to help them um, guide through using the plan. Uh, there's going to be looking towards having resolution for commitment to work towards this vision zero. And then we'll have our progress transparency going out. That will get something up on our website of helping track some of this information, putting this information out there. And then the funding opportunities. Anybody have any questions or want more? So this is really, is this like phase one planning part? You're getting ready to submit the plan, to see some funding, is that where we're at? Yes, we're that's what we're it's been working towards is we we initially got the funding was to create a plan towards working towards the next step of funding. Um so you got the funding for the planning. Now you're gonna submit what the needs are, correct? When, yeah, we're, when do you expect that to happen? The deadline for the first deadline for submitting for our is coming up here in just a couple of weeks that we're gonna be putting in some stuff for that. We are the plan the funding through the safe streets for all is there's three different pots out there. One is for planning to help you develop a plan, which is what we've been doing. The third pot is for implementation, which is going out and doing the big massive safety project or a bunch of smaller projects could also be done throughout this. Right now we're planning on doing it's a second pot, which is in the middle, which is a supplemental planning or demonstrations. And we're looking at taking some of this these major projects and looking at trying to get some additional funding to help make a more detailed plan engineering type stuff going towards those specific projects to be ready next year to apply for the implementation for something bigger. So you hope to have implementation of, of this win a couple years from now? Well, we hope to have yeah implementation hopefully next year for at least for starting to get some of the stuff. But the the thing is, is we want this to not just be it's not just focused on the safe streets for all implementation. We also are hoping to be able to work with communities to take these same things and look at the other programs that are out there for safety funding right now, such as the highway safety improvement plan through ODOT, which we've how this funding's gone through that. So we want it to be able to be used and help communities to help do more implementation other than just the safe streets for all. Well, I think a very important component of this is to focus on pedestrian and bicyclist safety. Uh, pedestrians and bicyclists are very vulnerable and obviously they have no crash protection at all, unlike the occupant of the car who has some crash protection. 
And uh, in order to uh, focus on uh, the pedestrians and cyclists safety, uh, I think we need a uh, public education campaign. We need um, a slogan, uh, be safe or be seen and be safe is the slogan, okay? Uh, and uh, you should put out a brochure just like this one. This is a new WRTA brochure that has some safety recommendations along with many other things. But a, um, uh, just a, a small brochure like this could be put out in-house uh, because uh, your planners, including Justin, are uh, trained in, in graphic design. So the front cover would say, uh, be seen and be safe. Uh, and then it would show, uh, you know, an icon of a pedestrian and also an icon of a cyclist. And then inside, there would be some very simple and very concrete common sense suggestions. And, and for both, obviously, both should wear bright and preferably reflective clothing, especially at night. The pedestrians should walk on the sidewalk if one exists. If not, they should be walking on the road facing the traffic. The cyclists, of course, should be uh, following all the traffic laws and riding with the traffic. We do not want to have accidents caused by having a wrong way cyclist, okay? So we can put these tips inside the brochure, uh, very specifically addressing this. And these brochures need to go in the places where you can reach the most vulnerable people. Very often, uh, poor people, financially poor people, uh, do not have or drive cars, and they uh, rely on cycling and walking a lot more. And the way to reach them, uh, is, one of the ways is to put these brochures in the rack at WRTA's federal station, at the uh, homeless shelters, and at soup kitchens. Uh, because many of these people have limited to non-existent internet access, but also all of the, this brochure should be on Eastgate's website and perhaps many others, uh, many other government websites. Uh, you know, especially uh, in the winter time, uh, we haven't had a, a really snowy winter in recent years, but obviously if the sidewalks are uh, snow covered, then you're gonna have piles of snow along the curves and then uh, pedestrians walking in the street in the wintertime and then uh, some of them get hit and, and sometimes killed and, and the coroner's office handles cases like this. Um, so that's, uh, that's what I'm recommending, uh, a public education campaign that can be, uh, you know, the brochure can be produced in-house. In you don't need a very expensive outside consultant or ad agency to produce a brochure like this. And, and put it in the right places to address the people who need to be reading it. Um, also, I, I think I sent to you by email several very concrete suggestions for pedestrian safety improvements in Cornersburg. And I think there were uh, some spots in Cornersburg there where you had some red on the map. And uh, I won't go into all of those in detail, but, you know, uh, Grant and, and Justin, you have my email, you know the five or six points that uh, I'm looking at there in Cornersburg to make it uh, pedestrian friendly and actually a model walkable community. Almost everything you need in Cornersburg by way of businesses, post office, bank, anything you want is within a 15 minute walk, all right? Um, so we need to focus on that and make it a, a, a model walkable neighborhood and improve pedestrian safety and make it possible to safely cross Marina Road and, and also uh, Canfield Road. Uh, so anyway, that's that's uh, those are just some uh, concrete suggestions from me and, and uh, I hope uh, you find that, that they have some merit. Let me add some comments about a personal experience. Riding my bicycle, middle of the day, Visibility, no snow. I had a bright orange top sweatshirt crossing a crosswalk with my bicycle. Got knocked over by a car. Driver's comment was, I didn't see him. So, all the brochures and all the suggestions in the world, if people aren't paying attention, it doesn't matter. Well, and you also would need to educate the motorists to uh, 
pay attention. You know, I mean, we have signs all over the place that say, um, watch out for motorcycles. There are yard signs all over the place. How about something that says, uh, watch out for bicyclists and pedestrians, the same format of yard signs. Uh, um, you know, when they came out with the uh, law in Ohio that said you have to give cyclists three feet of clearance, you know, the bicycle clubs put out uh, yard signs uh, that would go in yards or, or uh, long berms that said uh, three feet is the law. That law took effect a few years ago that motorists must give cyclists three feet of space. Uh, in other words, they're not to pass a cyclist uh, with without leaving at least a three foot clearance. They will do that if they see the cyclist and if they're not paying attention, they won't see it. Again, it, it won't matter. Cheryl, and only answer to this if you're comfortable. I hate to try, but was there a, a crash report filed for your police, incident? The policeman came. Okay. Uh, he talked to me, he talked to the motorist. I don't know anything. There was no serious or fatal injury, but I did get knocked off my bicycle onto the pavement. So. Because I think what we found in talking with the consultant through this process is that we have data for the big things, right? But a lot of things like what you're kind of describing here, Gerald, kind of go unnoticed. You know, there's a lot of near misses that we have no data, no way of record keeping for. And that kind of gets to the aspects of the systemic safety of where are these types of incidents likely to happen and how can we be better now? before we have to be reactive as a result of a fatal or serious crash. And I think that's what this is overarching trying to get to. Yeah, I know one thing I've seen, at least some of the data comes an issue is for something like the, especially bicyclists and pedestrian accidents ends up happening as there's a, not any serious injury comes out of it. It's a, you know, something where they just get bumped and there's no, it's sort of, I don't, no one's going to complain about it, so it's not necessarily ever ends up being reported because it's not a big enough crash or. And that's that is an issue that comes up for the bicycles and pedestrians because you know, looking at what the how bad it was or how much damage was done and if there's not anything there. We have to worry to not get reported, which is a lot of what we're trying to meet with these communities, find out what that's up there, find out some police say. This there's you know bicyclists nearly get hit in this area, but there's nothing in the crash records for it that says it ever happened. So that's one thing that's out there is a it's a problem that there hasn't been a very good solution for. As a former motorcyclist, you can't believe how many air misses I've been. People just have more depth and recent perception. Somebody coming to get a boy and riding something smaller than a car. They don't think you're going as fast as you are. They're running you, you know, they're making love to answer turns path. And it's just like, what are you looking at? Or we're just pulling up. The only accident I ever had was I was sitting on a red light and somebody hit me, hit me from behind. But it didn't damage. Yeah, you know, they probably swung probably four miles an hour and just hit me from behind. It's like taking a look at that. But you're right, the near misses don't get reported. I could relate one. Friend of mine riding his motorcycle and somebody threw a can out of the car and hit him in the forehead. Oh boy. So, I mean, <laughs> all kinds of strange things happen. In clothing, I mean, I've just recently, I almost hit a walker on South Avenue. There's no sidewalks. They're, they're walking on South and they're wearing dark clothing. You know, you don't have to reflect. Almost, a couple times I almost hit walkers. You know, it's all too. They said education, also clothing. You know, you don't see a clothing line for walkers, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, sometimes it's even hard if you work at a place uh, where you're required to wear, you know, black pants and a black shirt if you're working in a restaurant uh, and your only way of getting there is walking and you work a late shift. You may not be able to have the opportunity to put on something reflective or even to Gerald's point, even if you have something reflective on someone still even seeing you. Lots of confounding variables. It's not an easy problem to solve, uh, but hopefully we're getting steps closer.
I don't want to sound like I'm blaming the victims, uh, namely the uh, pedestrians and the bicyclists. Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, uh, I, I think a couple other points is that bicyclists need to obey the law and have uh, front and rear lights, proper lights if they're riding at night. And uh, ideally, pedestrians should carry a flashlight. And, and of course, both should wear bright, reflective clothing, especially at night. You know, maybe just uh, wear an orange jacket over that black restaurant uniform. I might make it. That's good if you can afford the, the brightly colored clothing. Instead of printing brochures, why not pass out reflective uniforms? Yeah. Yes. Minimal cost. I, if you, when if I was doing a, may not have work over in the research angle down with goats, they gave wear these yeah. lightweight reflective vests. I don't think that it costs more than a dollar or two dollars much. And you can distribute them at the homeless shelters and the soup kitchens and even at the WRTA Federal Station. You can distribute them for free and uh, it would probably cost less money than hiring these high paid consultants. Yeah, just a mesh, mesh this. All right, Grant, thank you. You're more than welcome to stay with us for the rest of the remaining of the evening. Um, Jeff, you want to talk about general policy board? Yeah, I'll talk about that. And just roll right into that. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so pretty simple with general policy board, like every month, uh, you know, our next meeting is coming up uh, next month on June 3rd at 10 a.m., which is a Monday, uh, right here in this room. If you're interested in attending or if you have something that you think should be included in the CAB's report, as always, just reach out to me, send me an email uh, with what you're thinking, and I'll make sure that that's reflective. And I'll work with Jerome and Genevieve uh, for that policy board report. We have a revision that's uh, presented that's going to be before the board with the cap. One of the regular, one of their policies that we wanted some language change. The bylaw language. The bylaw language. I'm sorry. Yeah, so that will go to policy board next month. I've uh, been working with our office manager to make sure that's all set up and ready to go. Uh, just a couple last week or the week before, sent out the vote uh, and that came back unanimous. Uh, this the board agreed to the revised language, so we'll push that up to the policy board. And I don't see any reason why that wouldn't be accepted and then we can get back to our own our own policies yeah and then we'll there. start digging into those procedures yep thank you yeah and then to roll right into the technical advisory committee uh not a whole lot to go through here uh let me kick grant out of the way just to pull up our website for a moment sorry grant <laughs> So as we roll through, work off to the computers. Uh, first up, we had the Appalachian Regional Commission program updates. Uh, as you'll see on the table over on the side, and for those of you folks joining us remotely, I'll make sure that the document is linked in the meeting summary. Uh, but the Appalachian Return on Investment Report uh, has come out for 2023. Um, lots of good information in there. There's a section specifically dedicated to Eastgate's work in that uh, program. Uh, so it's highlighting a lot of the projects that have come out of our region um, and, and great work that's been going on. Uh, another thing that Kathy Zook, uh, our ARC program manager, uh, gave an update on is the Appalachian State of the Region Conference, uh, which is always a great event, uh, very thoughtfully put together. Uh, but that'll be taking place May 14th. Uh, unfortunately, in-person registration is sold out. It uh, takes place, I believe, at uh, Ohio University, uh, their campus, but you can register to attend virtually, completely free. Uh, I think it starts in the morning, runs till about 2, 2 30-ish, uh, but I'll make sure the registration information uh, is available if you're interested in attending that event. Uh, our own Kathy Zook will actually be participating in a panel uh, this year. Um, in the past, she's moderated and even hosted that event. So. Uh, always great to, to have a participation there. Uh, an update on a federal ARC program called Ready Local Governments. Um, we had four of our local communities apply for that program and all four were selected to participate. Uh, it's a nine week program where they'll get training and uh, assistance to build capacity for identifying and applying for maybe some more untraditional uh, pathways to receive uh, 
funding for different projects that uh, local governments can capitalize on. Uh, so that's the city of Camel, city of Girard, Milton Township, and the village of McDonald uh, that will all be participating in that program. So really excited for those four communities. Uh, I think they'll get um, some great resources out of that. Uh, and then the big uh, Appalachian uh, news that uh, has kind of sucked all the air out of the room for the better part of a year and a half at this point now uh, is the Appalachian Community Grant Program. Uh, so just yesterday, a second announcement was uh, made for funding out of that program. And if you all remember, that was $500 million that uh, the governor of Ohio made available. Um, the first announcement was several weeks ago, uh, kicked off at the, the city of Camel School District, uh, was focused on uh, child health clinics, uh, particularly related to schools. Uh, the second announcement was made just yesterday by the governor for another $154 million in project awards uh, focused on downtowns and destinations. Uh, we have heard news that we should be more interested in the announcement coming next week. Uh, so we'll keep our fingers crossed that our project will be included in that next wave of announcements. Uh, we put in for almost $150 million request for 42 different projects around our region. So uh, we're hoping that we'll come out big and, and have a lot of money to spread around our local communities for those projects but uh, still awaiting our announcement for uh, what we'll receive from that program. Uh, up next, Jeff Gullner uh, showed off a new traffic counting tool. So I'll jump over to our website real quickly here uh, to show off um, under our maps and data, the traffic counting tab. So you'll see traffic count maps right here at the top. 2019 to 2023 will pop up this very neat interactive map. Uh, gives you some information on this little pop up box here. Uh, but what this is, is essentially a tool that if you're interested in traffic volumes, uh, you can go to this. And it's taking some time to load, but that's fine. And you can see all of the traffic volumes through our own uh, in-house traffic counting program. Uh, ODOT does their own for all ODOT maintained roadways. So uh, on their website, uh, you could find any ODOT traffic volumes, but if you're interested in what's been done by us locally for uh, local roads, this is the best place to get it. Um, the one button that I think is the superstar on this tool, uh, if you could see my cursor is this little funnel. Uh, so that's your filter. Uh, this will allow you to filter by community, uh, which is, I think the, the best way to, to view this data. Um, so if you want to pick a community, I'll pick on Vienna. Uh, there's some other opportunities to select here. If you're interested in just a specific year or only counts between certain volumes, uh, there's opportunities for that. But if you hit apply through the power of the internet, it will update the data. and automatically zoom into the community you selected. And you can see the traffic volumes for any of the roads that we counted. Um, you'll see kind of the year that it was counted, the name of the roadway, the traffic volume counts, and then there's even uh, a report there that you could see with um, all the Excel data that breaks it out into excruciating detail uh, if you're really interested in digging into the, the minutia of traffic volumes. Uh, but in addition to just traffic volumes, uh, there's a second tab that shows up bike and pedestrian counts, which is something that Grant has uh, been working on for the last few years, uh, really hoping to build out. Um, and as you'll see, if you selected a community in that first tab, uh, it'll carry over and you can view uh, the data. It'll uh, carry over that extent, uh, but we'll go back to the home extent uh, and you'll see all of the dots pop up here. Um, Grant put together this really neat uh, report that includes, you know, good data on uh, all of the counts that he's done for bike and pedestrian. It even pulls in, uh, you know, some weather data for the temperature of the day that it was counted. So you get some insight into what the behavior might have been uh, related to the temperature. Uh, but I think, Grant, you have some counters out now. So uh, this map will just continue to get populated uh, with new 
uh, more fresh data as that program continues to roll. Uh, but yeah, just a new tool that uh, we made available. Really interesting to look at. Uh, this is particularly helpful uh, for our local communities when they're applying for Ohio Public Works uh, funding. Uh, it requires a traffic count if they're putting in an application for roadway resurfacing. Uh, so that's where the bulk of our traffic volume counts come from is uh, doing counts for those projects. Uh, so really helpful for our local communities. Just uh, something cool to show up. Uh, and speaking of the Ohio Public Works Commission program, uh, Ed Davis, who runs that for us, uh, gave an overview of kind of the next round, uh, talked through the, the timeline process, how that program works, um, and some of the next steps for the committee that runs that uh, process. So uh, he also mentioned that pre-applications for that next round of funding uh, will be due August 29th. So uh, communities can start getting a head start and thinking about what they want, would like to apply for uh, through that program. A lot of roadway resurfacings, um, some uh, sewer and stormwater uh, infrastructure is also eligible through that program. And then lastly, uh, we had a presentation uh, by Eric Svensson, who is kind of behind the scenes uh, in our office, doesn't really uh, get out up front. Uh, he's usually uh, in the back of the room with a camera uh, or posting on our website and our social media doing a lot of that work. Uh, but one of the things that he's kind of taken on is our public participation process uh, and plan. Um, so he kind of talked through his process for looking through that um, and really updating it uh, to match a lot of our behavior that has changed since uh, the pandemic. So we've integrated a lot more virtual opportunities for uh, involvement uh, in our work. Um, so bringing that document up to date uh, to make sure it best reflects what we're actually doing, uh, as well as closer ties us to the bipartisan infrastructure law, uh, which clarified how public participation can happen uh, for agencies like ours. So as that gets to draft form, I'll make sure that that gets to you all uh, to take a look at. We're going to have a pretty extensive public review period for that document just to make sure, you know, we didn't miss anything and things make sense to you all. Uh, and also for you all to provide suggestions for things to include in that. Um, so more on that to come uh, over the next few months. But uh, yeah, that was everything we talked about at TAC. So if anybody has any questions, otherwise we can keep rolling. We want to do a couple of these uh, two resolutions are pretty straightforward. Yes. So resolution six and seven, uh, I will caveat resolution six. Um, we were made aware earlier today after our TAC meeting, uh, the Young city of Youngstown projects, uh, the roadways that are listed on that uh, are inaccurate. Uh, there was some changes that happened after their application came into us uh, to change some of those roadways. So uh, after the meeting, I'll make sure that the uh, updated resolution with the correct language gets sent out uh, with the meeting information so that uh, the board is voting on the accurate language there. Uh, but those are the uh, projects that are seeking surface transportation block grant uh, funds. So we had Joey and Stephen in uh, last month, I believe. Uh, to talk about those programs. Uh, these are the projects that are filtering out through that uh, and will be awarded funding. Uh, the second resolution there is related to that public participation process. Uh, this is just kind of our formality that says we're uh, updating this plan to bring it up to standard uh, as identified by the bipartisan infrastructure law. Um, and like I said, we've got kind of the rest of the process here where we bring it to you all and uh, formally adopt the final version. So this is just kind of the first step of the process. We'll talk about the uh, annual meeting that we're going to have in a couple of weeks. Uh -huh. So Wednesday, May 15th uh, is the date that we'll be having our annual meeting uh, up at Stamba Auditorium again. Uh, we've had it there last several years. Uh, it's a great space. Um, we always get great attendance. I think last year we were almost at like 325 people uh, that attended. Uh, so a great response. Uh, this year, starting at 7.30, uh, 7.30 to 8.30, we'll have kind of a networking and breakfast. Uh, the program will officially kick off at 8.30, uh, and we'll wrap up 
1030, maybe closer to 11, uh, depending on how good we do to keep to the uh, timing on our agenda. Um, uh, we've got a great program. Uh, Jim obviously will kind of give a presentation from Eastgate's perspective uh, to talk about uh, the work that we do. Um, a lot of what he'll talk about, I think he's been to this group to share uh, in January, uh, really just kind of an update to a lot of that information, projects that we're involved in or carrying out. Uh, but we'll also be bringing in a member of the team that's uh, conducting our housing strategy for Mahoning and Trumbull counties, uh, Erica Spade Petras. Uh, so she'll talk about kind of housing from a higher level. Uh, you know, why it's important for us to do this work, what it means uh, to have this type of plan, what other communities in Ohio are seeing, and if that's different from what's presenting uh, in our local communities, uh, and how we kind of move forward from there. And then we'll also have a panel focused on regional economic development. Uh, so if you were paying attention to some of the news coming out uh, from uh, last week or the week before, there was an announcement by the governor uh, for this new economic development district called Lake to River. Uh, so uh, network partner of Jobs Ohio uh, that kind of fills a new uh, a need in the economic development organization kind of framework. So Eastgate fills one of those uh, roles where we uh, are responsible for creating the comprehensive economic development strategy, uh, also interfacing with the US Economic Development Administration to help communities access funding through that uh, agency. The regional chamber is more focused on uh, their member businesses, uh, so uh, employee or employer retention and expansion. Uh, this new agency uh, network partner of Jobs Ohio will be focused on uh, economic development attraction and site preparedness and site readiness. Uh, so defined roles, uh, defining uh, kind of lanes for economic development. Uh, we'll also have um, some information related to Valley Vision 2050, uh, which is a, a very development focused approach uh, from all of those entities and, and a few others uh, looking at different aspects of, of how we can more holistically tie things to development like arts and culture and parks uh, and the role that, that we have to kind of look broader than just the nuts and bolts of uh, business attraction, retention and expansion. Uh, and then lastly, uh, we'll have a member of the chamber uh, to talk about kind of their reformed role. So before they think they were uh, performing a lot of work that was maybe outside their scope uh, or bounds, but with this new organization kind of coming in and filling that need, uh, they can kind of reformat how they work. Uh, so we'll kind of clear all of that, be able to uh, set this new regional path uh, for development. We'll have a discussion about the, the panel there. Um, but yeah, great event. Uh, the registration link is in the agenda. Um, we'd love to have you all there. Um, the individual tickets, fifty dollars. Yes. Does that apply to? So that is your ticket to attend. Uh, in the past, uh, in and currently this year, uh, members of the CAB are comped. So if you're interested in attending, feel free to let me know, and I can uh, make sure you're on the list. I think Jerome, you would. Uh, signed up and, and I believe Genevieve uh, you mentioned uh, you were going so you're can you can you make sure we at least sit together because last year I was sitting with the hospital group and they were talking you know <laughs> they talk about that hospitals I was like in the fog there <laughs> yeah last year we so we had a lot of people buy like table sponsorships. So seating was a very challenging thing. Uh, this year will be a lot more loose on the seating arrangements. So it should be easier to so we can talk to each other. Yeah. <laughs> well, my knowledge base for what they were talking about is limited. <laughs> uh, the, the other thing that I had on the agenda is uh, it's May, which means it's bike month. Uh, also going to be air quality awareness uh, week. So we are running through Go Ohio Commute, which is our commuting service platform, um, mode shift challenge. So if you typically drive alone uh, to work or to school or to wherever, uh, try and carpool or take transit or bike or walk if you can. Uh, the, the benefit there is that you can sign up for a Go Ohio Commute account, uh, log your trips where you're doing those activities and potentially win gift cards. Uh, so. A, a nice little incentive to participate in that program. Um, like, yeah, just a, 
new little thing we're trying out. Anybody else have any comments, any announcements? I mean, I'll kick it to Kevin if he wants to share some news about a future CAB meeting. Uh, we're our October meeting. We're we're I got one more hurdle to, to jump through, but we're looking to uh, hold that at the airport. I got that up at the airport. Uh, uh, the, the schedule of events will be weather dependent. Um, we'd like to uh, so everybody see some of the facilities. Um, if we can, we'll, we have a people mover that will attach to a, a large uh, tractor that we can go up and down um, Hangar Road, take a look at some of the improvements that have been made over the past few years, which are many, and just give you a little um, this was what we could do with visitors as far as we could go to some of the facilities we have out there. It's pretty interesting what goes on behind the scenes there. So we'll, we'll do that. We might, uh, if it's possible, depending on what time it gets dark, we may maybe have the meeting about a half hour earlier or something along that line, or we might just go out for a field trip first, something like that, and hold the meetings separate. But we're going to we're, we're gonna try to accommodate everybody out there. So yeah, just a little preview to give people time to you know think through uh, logistics of of getting there. Uh, we used to do field trips back in the day uh, for the CAB, so kind of get back into that. It's nice to explore what we've got. Uh, kind of. It'll be October third. And I'll make sure to have that included in future agendas and the meeting summary, uh, so that that's on there. Question about that. Um, when the airbase had their open house, they confiscated lighters, knives, matches. Are there any We're not going near the airbase. We'll go up to any restrictions on. No, no. Okay. We'll, we'll go as far as uh, up by the tower, by the control tower. We have a lot of um, we have a lot of rehabilitation uh, projects going on this year. Um, first phase of about twenty-four million dollars in. Uh, uh, projects to some of the aprons to some of the ramps. We're just we're trying to push it. We're trying to start it early in July to see where we end up because a lot of parts of the airport that I would like to go and tour through are, might be closed off. But I think we'll be good for the end of October. Um, Randy Partika, who is our uh, chief engineer, he's down at Columbus at the Ohio Aviation Association meeting and. Uh, I thought he'd be back today for a meeting, but we had to put that off. But he'll know more of the timeline that we're that some of these projects are going on. Because I rather we'd rather go outside and just have a meeting up in the in the terminal. So we'll see how you know how it goes. But for right now, we're about ninety five percent for what happened there. I just thought of an announcement. If you want to see a riverfront village, love how they're doing the river with their dock this weekend. If it doesn't rain, it's May the 4th, this Saturday. But it if it does rain, it's May the 5th. But there's going to be like vendors and uh, stuff to for sale. But you could walk along the river and see what they've done to it. And, and, the, and the village, how they're revamping the downtown for economic development. So just from 10 to 3 to the, tomorrow, to Saturday. Unfortunately, I think rain is forecast both for Saturday and Sunday, but it is nice what they've done down there with the uh, new boat launch after taking the dam out of there. And then they have a new, uh, a nice new comfort station there yeah. uh, right at the boat launch. Um, the pavilion is really nice. pavilion's slowly going up. Yes. <laughs> slowly. <laughs> a great preview of what we'll be talking about in July. At our July meeting, we'll have Stephanie Dyer in to talk about the Mahoning River Restoration Project. Uh, get an update on how that's going and, and what we're looking forward to uh, in the next year here. Uh, really exciting. Uh, but I do want to say uh, Sarah Lowry, uh, who's having some trouble with her mute button, uh, wanted to point out that May 19th is Bike Belmont. Uh, we've got some flyers, I believe, over on the table there. I'll include the follow up information in the meeting summary uh, for anybody that wants to participate. Uh, Going to be a great event. Uh, lots of fun, lots of activities lined up uh, for that type of participation. And uh, this is, I believe, the second year this is taking place. Uh, so uh, maybe a little traditional thing that might carry on. It's great to see. Is there any update on the uh, dam removal? Some little resistance there. I suspect you're asking about the Levittsburg Dam. Yes. 
Uh, so yeah, um, you know, that's following its, its uh, expected process. Um, that is the Trumbull County Metro Parks project. Uh, they were awarded through Ohio EPA's WRRSP program, uh, which is the Water Resources Sponsorship Program. I missed a W in there. But, uh, essentially, they were awarded, funded, uh, they selected a team uh, to do the design and uh, the actual implementation of that project. Uh, right now, they're doing all the first year investigative work that's required for that. Um, there's been a lot of public uh, you know, concern about what this dam removal would impact outside of the specific river itself. Uh, you know, there's some concern for the floodplain, there's uh, concern for the roadway that is nearby. Uh, all of that is part of the uh, design process of removing a dam. They don't just go in with hammers and chisels and, and pull the thing out. Uh, there's a lot of thought that goes in uh, to the engineering of this. Um, so that's proceeding uh, as usual. Uh, there is some conversation about, um, you know, alternative studies and, and more information gathering. Uh, the team is open to that. Uh, the more information, the better. Uh, they're not resistant to, uh, you know, other ideas being investigated, but uh, the position of Ohio EPA is that uh, through their research and their data collection, that the dam itself is the impoundment in the river that is negatively impacting the water quality and habitat. Uh, so it, it is hard to identify alternative solutions other than removing the actual physical dam itself. Um, so the team is proceeding uh, with that. It's in a process. I just thought that all of that had already been dedicated because we've been talking about this how long yeah, five years or more, and I thought it was all, they're all gone. And then at the snap of. And then Summit Street, that's on schedule too, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Summit Street uh, is on schedule. That'll actually come out this year. They're working through their <laughs> set up the staging area right there, at the van location. Um, that'll be really uh, fun to see. You know, it's a very visible project. There's kind of a walkway on the other side of the river there. Uh, so. I, highly encourage as they're actually removing if you have a chance to go up there uh, and you know watch that in progress i remember going down the road uh when that was out. It's really fun to see um that'll be out this year and stephanie will have some announcements about uh some of the other projects that are still lingering out there the next one is the one that's in uh cleveland close uh -huh. That's up by the uh, RG Steel property. We own half of that, but uh, yep. Cleveland Fuss pretty much controls the fate of that one. Yeah. The Gerard Dam, that's going to take some angel funding there. Uh, I, I'm, I feel good about the, the possibility of removing the Gerard Dam. I'll kind of put that there. Uh, that's the hardest one. It's the largest dam. Uh, it's been kind of the, the pain point in this entire planning process of how do we address that? Um, but in our work with the Army Corps of Engineers, uh, it's looking promising. There is a pathway uh, for us to be able to resolve that. Does the uh, oak plant still need that uh, dam in the Mahoney River there? So we, we are working with Cleveland Cliffs and a representative from that business, um, having conversations with them. Uh, they do still draw water for their operations. They have a water intake facility on the Mahoney River, uh, and we have been working with them to identify ways that we can make them full. So as we remove that dam, the water level, level of the river will drop. Uh, so we're, we're working with them. They've done some preliminary engineering analysis to identify what type of work they would need to do to their intake facility to make sure that they could still draw the water that they need. Um, all of that work's been done. Uh, we're moving on to the next stage of conversations of actually forming that work so that when this process happens, uh, they will not be impacted. There's an easy slip up. Kimberly Clark did the same because they got the, uh, uh, there's one large pump station on the west side of the river that Cleveland Cliffs owns. There's three on the east side of the river um, that the Port Authority owns. We sold the largest one um, that the one that draws 22 million gallons of water a day from the river. Cleveland Chris is pretty much just as big. And they looked at it and they, uh, Kimberly Clark looked at it and they go, yeah, it's going to need some modifications to the intake pipes, but 
nothing that's a hurdle that they can't jump over. Yep. So I think what you guys are doing with Cleveland puts that's by them too. Yep. And that's not the one of the largest teams. That's a, that's a large team. No, that should be a, a fairly routine one. To, to... Yeah. Any other comments, announcements? Yeah, I think we'll do our meeting. Thank you, everybody. Mm -hmm.